Hello, my name is Muhammad Ibrahim and I am lecturer at the University of Hargeisa. In this session we will discuss ultrasound evaluation of pregnant cervix. We will talk about the indications, techniques, limitations and pitfalls of these techniques. We will ask what to measure and when to measure. We will discuss dynamic changes, pathophysiology of the short cervix. Finally, we will see amniotic fluid sludge. The cervix should be routinely evaluated in the second and third trimester of pregnancy, especially in patients at risk for placenta previa, vasa previa, cervical incompetence, and preterm birth. The cervix may be evaluated transabdominally, translabially, or transvaginally. With all techniques, cervical length is measured from the internal os to the external os. The cervix is evaluated for shortening and dilatation. The region of internal os is evaluated for vasa previa and the relationship of cervical edge of the placenta and internal os is determined. The transabdominal technique, the cervix is ex examined through a full urinary bladder using 3.5 to 5 megahertz transducer. Such scanning is performed in the midline until the longitudinal axis of the cervix is seen, showing the endocervical canal. What's good in transabdominal technique is that it gives you an overview, but unfortunately, it does not have sufficient reliability due to the full bladder which results in elongation of the cervix and obscuring of any funneling of internal loss. The other thing is, fetal part may obscure cervix, especially after 20 weeks, and the distance from the probe to the cervix will degrade image quality. Therefore, transabdominal technique alone should not be used for assessment of the cervix. This is transabdominal sonography of the cervix through a full bladder cervix appears longer than it actually is. This is another image of transabdominal sonography. Look at the fetal head, engaged too low, masking the internal loss. So if you try to measure cervical length, you won't see the internal loss here. In this image, there is a shadow, probably from the symphysis views. There is another shadow from the fetal head. No internal loss, no external loss, no endocervical canal appearing here. Therefore, all these images are not acceptable for evaluating the cervix. In translabial or transperennial technique, we use the same transducer used for transabdominal technique. The transducer should be covered with a plastic wrap to minimize the risk of infection. A scanning is usually performed with, with an empty bladder. The transducer is placed longitudinally on the anterior perineum between the labia. Orientation of the probe is that beam is directed to this way, coming parallel with the vagina, and on ultrasound monitor, vagina will appear on top. The cervix is adequately visualized in above 90% of patients, especially in the third trimester. The advantage of this technique is transducer does not enter the vagina, so no pressure on the cervix. Also, it does not require an additional probe. The main technical limitation is of this technique is gas in the rectum, which can impede visualization of the cervix. This is translabial sonogram. Here is the vagina near the probe, appears at the top of the monitor, is parallel to the beam. Here is the cervix perpendicular to the beam. Here is the anterior lip, posterior lip, and endocervical canal. Cervical length is measured from the internal os to the external os. This is another translabial sonogram. 
this is gas in the rectum obscuring the external os so it's not possible to evaluate cervix using like this image in transvaginal technique a clean transvaginal probe covered by a condom inserted three to four centimeters into the vagina to avoid compression of the cervix and to image the cervix within the effective focal zone of the transducer. Patients should be on empty bladder, sagittal long axis view of the endocervical canal is obtained. Cervical length is measured from the internal loss to the external loss along the endocervical canal. This is the, trans, the ideal transvaginal image of the cervix and it is longest axis in this digital view. The internal and external os here are seen well. The entire endocervical canal also clearly seen. The image is enlarged so it can occupy two thirds of the screen. Even in transvaginal technique, there might be limitations and pitfalls like a full bladder which can exert pressure on the cervix and mask possible funneling or opening of internal loss. Also, too much pressure by the examiner, and this can be identified by excessive echogenicity of the cervix. Excessive pressure can also mask funneling and elongate the cervix. And uh, uterine segment contraction might mimic the appearance of funneling of internal os. On ultrasound, contraction will appear as rounded myometrium around the cervix and a normal cervix distal to the contraction. What about the cervical length in this patient? It looks normal, measuring about 35 millimeters. Look at the bladder, it is full. When bladder is emptied, the true cervical length is seen shorter, measuring only 17 millimeters. This is transvaginal sonography of the cervix. Look at the anterior lip of the cervix. It is significantly thinner than the posterior lip. This is due to the excessive pressure from the vaginal prop. Look also here, the posterior lip echogenicity is increased due to the pressure. This is another image of the cervix shows the anterior and posterior lips of the cervix are equal but still there's increased echogenicity below the posterior lip of the cervix. This demonstrates that there's still excessive pressure making the measurement of the cervix inadequate. And uh, this is a clip showing how the pressure will affect the cervix. It will appear like it is closed where it actually is dilated. This ultrasound image shows a cervix with significant lower uterine segment contractions. The lower uterine segment contraction severely distorts the landmarks of the cervix. Here we can see pseudocervical length measuring more than 50 millimeters. This measurement alone should make you suspect of contractions. In, in this image, this is not funneling. The true cervix starts from here, and this is lower uterine segment contraction creating pseudo -funneling. Then let us ask what to measure. Most important thing to measure is cervical length, measured from the internal os to the external os along the cervical canal. This is transvaginal sonogram. Cursor is placed here at the internal os and here are the external loss along the cervical canal. This is transperineal sonogram. Here is the internal loss, and here is the external loss, and this is how to measure the cervical length. If cervical canal is curved, the cervical length can be measured as the sum of two to three straight lines that essentially follow the curve or by one tracing line between the internal loss and external loss. Short cervical length is usually straight. Presence of careful cervix usually means cervical length is more than 25 millimeters. 
A normal cervical length is 25 to 50 millimeters at 14 to approximately 30 weeks. Short cervical length is that less than 25 millimeters at these gestational ages. With the best prediction for return birth at 16 to 24 weeks, the shorter the length, the higher the risk for return birth. A cervical length greater than 50 millimeters reflects a measurement that includes the lower uterine segment. This normal cervix measuring 35 millimeters, and this is short cervix measuring 14 millimeters. This dilated cervix, the measured part is this closed part. Also in this image, the measured part is this remaining part of the cervix known as functional cervix. The other question is when to measure. Almost all patients, even those at highest risk, have normal cervical length in the first trimester. Before 14 weeks, measuring cervical length might be predictive only in very high risk women such as those with a history of large cervical biopsy or second trimester pregnancy loss. And sensitivity for prediction of preterm birth is very low at 10 to 14 weeks because it's difficult to distinguish between lower uterine segment and uterine cervix. After 30 weeks, the cervical length progressively shortens in preparation for term birth. So cervical length less than 25 millimeters after 30 weeks can be physiologic and not associated with an increased risk of preterm birth in asymptomatic women. So the best time to do cervical evaluation is between 18 to 22 weeks because it is the common gestational age when phenylene or short cervix is developed. But uh, keep in mind, high-risk patients might have early cervical changes. Therefore, the earlier the short cervical length is detected means the higher the risk of preterm birth. Here, history is very important to determine when to measure cervical length. A patient with classical history of cervical incompetence might benefit from early ultrasound to decide their need for intervention. The other thing to measure is phenylene. Phenylene is defined as protrusion of the amniotic fluid and membrane into the internal loss. Typically, phenyl width is measured by identifying the lower uterine segment notch, either anteriorly or posteriorly or both, and a line perpendicular to the axis of the cervical canal connected to the opposite side the funnel length is measured by connecting the middle of the funnel width with the tip of the funnel. If funnel is seen, then the shape should be recorded. It can be normal T-shape when the internal loss is closed, canal is closed, and external loss is closed. It can also be described as Y, then V, then U, according to the degree of funnel. If you are afraid of, you will forget this. Trust your vaginal ultrasound. Then let us see an example. This is closed cervix, internal os is closed, canal is closed, and external os. This is a little bit dilated internal os, given Y shape. This is more funnel in, given V shape. This is complete dilatation of U shape. It appears that U shape funnel in is more likely to be associated with preterm birth. The cervix may appear completely normal at one point in the examination and very abnormal at another point during the course of five to 10 minute examination. This is called dynamic changes. And this usually happens if a woman is having contractions. This is a patient who had a history of pregnancy loss here the cervix appears normal at 12-42 minutes, measuring about 4 cm or 40 mm. Then just after 2 minutes, 
Look at the surface. It's too short, measuring only 11 millimeters or 1.1 centimeters. Therefore, in patients at risk for cervical incompetence or in whom initial ultrasound images show a cervical abnormality, the cervix should be evaluated more than once and observed continuously for several minutes. A follow-up study in two to three days is indicated if suspicious, but non-diagnostic changes are seen. In some women who have irritable cervix, when you apply fundic pressure, like in this patient, cervix might shorten. So when changes occur, the shortest cervical length should be recorded. There are three main mechanisms that have been associated with the development of the short cervical length. The most obvious hypothesis is that short cervical length is caused by an intrinsic weakness of the cervix or cervical insufficiency. In most cases, the cervical insufficiency is due to traumatic or surgical damage, sometimes in rare cases due to congenital disorders or connective tissue disease. The second hypothesis is that short cervical length is due to inflammatory or infectious process. There is a strong association between short cervical length on transvaginal ultrasound and infection. The third hypothesis is that contraction is my cause the short cervical length and studies have shown that the majority of asymptomatic women with cervical length less than 25 millimeters before 24 weeks have some contractions more than the normal cervix. Sometimes you might notice free floating hyperechogenic material within the amniotic fluid in close proximity to the uterine cervix. It is proposed the term of uh, amniotic fluid is large to refer to this sonographic finding. Amniotic fluid is large has been identified in asymptomatic women with uh, at risk for spontaneous preterm delivery in the mid trimester of pregnancy, and is also an independent risk factor for preterm preliminary rupture of membrane and spontaneous preterm delivery. This is an example of uh, amniotic fluid sludge in a patient with a short cervix and cervical funnel. This is another example of a patient with a short cervix and large amount of amniotic fluid sludge. Finally, let us summarize what we have seen. Indications of cervical evaluation, ultrasound techniques, transabdominal, translabial, transvaginal, procedures, advantages and disadvantages of each techniques, what to measure, cervical length and funnel, normal versus abnormal, when to measure, dynamic changes, spontaneous or after transfundal pressure, pathophysiology of short cervix and amniotic fluid sludge. Thank you.